Welcome to our ongoing series of videos related to structural analysis. This is from chapter three, section two. And this is our second video in the series, which we're labeling video B. Uh, we're addressing one force and two force connections. Our next video will be addressing moment connections. Um, one force and two force connections are also sometimes called roller joints or pin joints. We talked about the nature of joints in chapter one when we talked about the overall um, issue of uh, structural design and structural conceptualization. We also talked about it again in chapter five under columns where moment joints and pin joints were crucial parts of the restraints of elements carrying compression. We're revisiting the subject again and all of this uh, replication and uh, emphasis on the subject is really crucial, first of all, because connections are absolutely crucial to holding the structure together. Uh, but second of all, they can be a very uh, important and elegant part of expressing the structure. And you as architectural designers should be thinking carefully about what kind of joints will be most expressive and most beautiful in your structures. So the simplest kind of connection that we can have uh, produces a single force in a single direction. We sometimes refer to this um, as a roller joint, although um, it can be manifest in a number of different ways. The key thing is from a structural analysis point of view, there's only a single direction the force can occur. So for example, here we might have some kind of a bearing surface and a roller and the structure is up above and it's pretty apparent from this that the nature of this roller is such that uh, because it's a roller, it can't produce any kind of horizontal resistance. It just rolls uh, in the horizontal direction, but it certainly produces an upward or vertical force. So we would say that the reactive force from this support we'll call R, meaning a reaction. And in this case, we're going to call it R sub Y, meaning we know from the nature of the situation that it's in the Y direction, or in other words, the vertical direction. Um, the second type of connection or restraint that we can have is called a pin joint. Um, it's a two-directional uh, restraint or constraint, depending upon the, how you uh, want to use your terminology. But the idea is it can produce whatever vertical component is necessary and whatever horizontal component is necessary to constrain the structure under whatever forces are applied to the structure. So symbolically, we represent it this way, and what we mean is that it's anchored to some kind of support structure, which is very stable, and then there's some sort of a pin joint or effective pin joint at the tip of this pyramid. Now, sometimes uh, it's not very literal. For example, in the case of this structure, um, these two supports, these two concrete piers, are capable of producing an upward force. Um, this one right here, the bolt and the nut on the bolt have been pulled down tight against the top of this flange. So not only is there an upward force here, but there's whatever lateral force is necessary to keep this beam from moving over the top of this. On the other hand, on the other end of this beam, if we have a slotted connection and then there's a nut that's just loosely pulled down to keep wind suction, for example, from pulling this beam up off the support or some kind of seismic influence from throwing it up off of the support. So there is some sort of a nut there that constrains it against vertical movement. But if that nut is very loose and it's kept loose by locking another nut down on it so that it doesn't inadvertently sort of crank down and then develop corrosion or whatever and at some point restrain movement in this direction, 
So these two nuts are tied together so that they're assured that they're not pressing down on the top of this uh, flange, in which case they produce whatever vertical force is required, but no horizontal force because the slotted connection allows a release of that force. So we would call this slotted connection, we'd call it a roller joint or a single force restraint. This would be a two force or a pin joint restraint. We can have more literal types of roller joints. So for example, if you observe bridges on the highways, you'll often see a situation where on one end of this bridge, you'll have some sort of a steel plate with a vertical steel plates. So there's a horizontal steel plate that's anchored to a concrete anchorage or pier. Then there are vertical steel plates that look like this and they'll have holes, a hole drilled through them and a pin inserted. And then this would be the bridge beam up above. And the key thing about this bridge beam is that um, it's supported by this pin joint, which can produce a vertical force or a horizontal force, but it allows absolutely free rotation at that point. So there's no kind of moment constraint occurring. Um, this joint is crucial to keep this bridge over time from sort of walking off of its supports because it expands and contracts under thermal conditions. In fact, bridges are classic problems. Um, they get the midsummer sun, which causes them to drastically overheat and expand. Uh, they face up towards the cold winter sky, which causes them to contract fairly dramatically. Um, and so, uh, and, and they sit on supports that don't move very much. So the supports are anchored to the earth and there's a lot of differential movement between the bridge and whatever those supports are. So it becomes pretty crucial that on a bridge we have the pin joint on one end that keeps it from walking off its supports, but on the other end we need some kind of a rocker joint or a roller joint that allows it to stress relieve itself. Uh, so a rocker joint is actually like a wheel. You can sort of visualize a wheel, except the wheel never rolls all the way around, so we don't need the whole wheel. We just need a portion of the wheel um, that's sufficient to allow it to sort of rock back and forth. So as the bridge contracts in the cold weather, it does something like this. As the bridge expands in the warm weather, it goes here, and in sort of its neutral position, it's right there. Uh, here we have uh, side by side two of these. Here we have an anchored down sort of pyramid with the pin joint here. So this is what holds the bridge from sort of walking off its supports. At the other end of this beam will be a rocker joint that looks like this. Um, and this rocker joint happens to be supporting this beam. And by the way, there is an expansion joint up in here that involves uh, fingers that go through each other so that uh, you don't develop a big, huge gap in the roadbed and vehicles can roll over it fairly smoothly. But that expansion joint allows this end of this beam to move back and forth under uh, thermal differential movement. And this rocker joint goes from this side bearing to that side bearing and right at the moment we see it sort of in its neutral position. <laughs> now in the case of bridges because the differential movement is really dramatic and important um, we, we make a major point of engineering really good uh, pin joints and really good rocker joints. Uh, we often have those things in a building without even engineering them in. We just understand by the nature of the building that there are certain kinds of movement which can take place fairly easily and the building will uh, sort of automatically accommodate those things and uh, other situations where they won't and we need to understand when we can rely on that kind of flexibility in the structure and when we can't. So, for example, in the case of this structure, here we have an arch, uh, 
which is tied together across the bottom. And that arch, when we get developed snow load, the arch tends to expand outward. It stretches this tension member and there's a, a differential movement where this joint moves outward in this direction and that joint moves outward in that direction. Now, if, if these were really fixed points here, we'd end up with some serious stress. Uh, for example, in the case of the bridge, these points would be uh, um, very rigidly anchored and we would have to have some kind of joint there to stress relieve uh, relative to that movement. In the case of this building though, we have a tall slender column and that slender column, it turns out, will actually easily accommodate that tiny movement without creating any undue stress. So we rely on the flexibility of that column to be effectively like a roller joint. So we, can't, we don't need a slotted connection at the top there or a slotted connection there to accommodate the differential movement. And even if we had a slotted connection, it probably wouldn't work because the weight of the structure and the friction on the top of the column would probably cause the column to get pushed out a tiny bit anyway. So the key thing is this tension member is much stiffer in terms of resisting horizontal forces than this tall cantilevered column ever could be. And the cantilevered column is going to tend to move enough to handle any kind of differential movement associated with that spanning structure. Now, we can do things that will screw up this structure and not make it work. And I happen to have this diagram because I'm aware of um, a facility that got built uh, where they had a problem of this sort. It was an equestrian center with uh, 300 foot long glue lamb arches. And I think they were like three or four inch diameter steel uh, tension rods on the bottom here. And in the case of this equestrian center, some stringers were put in that connected really high on these columns. And these stringers were used to support stands for observers for the equestrian activities that were occurring down below. The effect of these stringers was to very severely uh, inhibit movement at this point. So the normal movement of this tall slender column was inhibited by the stringers and the structure was left effectively with these short squat columns above the connection point for the stringers. And when snow load came or on any new additional gravity load, the outward push of these arches would stretch these tension members and actually introduced cracks, bending cracks, uh, at these points near the tops of these columns. Uh, this would be a situation where you actually would want to have a slotted connection at one end or the other end of these arches to accommodate that differential movement. And of course, there would be movement of that sort also associated with uh, thermal variations in the roof structure. So you have to look at your situation and you have to assess do we have uh, enough flexibility to avoid some kind of stress overload? And if we don't, uh, then we have to design these columns so that they're strong enough in bending so that they don't crack at that point. This problem could have also been solved by putting a slotted connection at the ends of uh, the stringers on one side of the structure so that the stringers no longer represented a really severe constraint. Okay, so we have various ways of expressing a pin joint. This is a, uh, a joint from the Pompidou Museum in Paris uh, in this particular building, which is a really classic kind of modernist building that was uh, intended to express the technological behavior of the building. Uh, pin joints were, were very clearly manifest as pin joints and moment connections were very clearly manifest as moment connections, but this is a true pin joint where this person is pulling this pin out and once this uh, structure has been inserted into these slots, the pin will get inserted back in.
Um, we don't have to be this literal, but in the early days of uh, building truss bridges, for example, most trusses had pin joints because the uh, state of engineering knowledge was such that they couldn't analyze a truss with moment connections and they were concerned that those moment connections might create problems uh, that they were unaware of. So in modern trusses we almost never bother with anything like this because it's too much trouble and we've discovered that if even if we weld the joints those uh, the, the, the small amount of moment that occurs in those connections doesn't uh, substantially disturb the behavior of the truss or cause any serious problems. In this particular building though, they knew they didn't have to have these kinds of pure pin joints, but they made them anyway uh, because they wanted to express the nature of the structure. You can find pin joints in other places. This is a a laterally braced structure in a seismic zone in Berkeley, California. And here we have uh, super pin joints down at the base. So there's the pin and there's another pin at each one of these connections down at the bottom. And you'll notice, by the way, all these have multiple plates on the bottom, multiple plates on the top. And the, the reason for that is that uh, that puts this, this pin in what we call multiple shear. In other words, in order to fail that pin, you would literally have to shear it in, um, I don't know, many, many different locations. And as a consequence, um, the pin is, is much more uh, effective in terms of transmitting a force. So you can use a smaller pin. A smaller pin means less friction relative to rotation. Um, and so that's the philosophy of using those multiple plates. This is a close-up view of that. So we'd have shear between that plate and that one, and that one and that one, and that one and that one and that one and that one and so forth. So we'd have shear once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven times. We'd have to shear that pin in order to fail it. And if we didn't do it that way, if we put it in uh, double shear or even single shear, the pin would have to be much larger in diameter and if it corrodes, that means it begins to develop much more resistance to rotation because its diameter is large and the lever arm for uh, that corrosive resistance uh, is greater. Okay, so we've seen examples of pin joints before, but here's another one. This is uh, the SOM structure in Virginia. And so we have a pin joint right here. In this case, we have a clevis on each side, so this pin joint is in double shear. Um, we have a similar type structure uh, in RDU, where this pin basically is connecting one side of this clevis to the other, and it would have to be sheared twice in order to make it fail. This is a different view. In this case, because it's in double shear, and also because there's a gap between the shearing planes, so that pin's also not just in shear, but it's got some bending stress in it. Um, the pin is really quite large. All right, so here's another structure. There are basically pins going through each of these joints. And as a consequence, the angle of this member can vary relative to the angle of that, depending upon the nature of the loads on it. Here's another example of a pin joint. These are the eye, eye bars we talked about before, where to accommodate the effect of the material removal near the end where the pin hole is drilled, the, uh, the bar is actually expanded outward at, the, at that point so that the joint is not the failure. Okay, so here we have a structure that's not, not quite a pin joint exactly because you'll notice there are two bolts through the ends of every one of these uh, angles that represent the web member. But these are punched holes. The holes are punched large enough that any kind of movement that occurs there is going to be stress relieved because those two bolts are very close together and they have at least a sixteenth of an inch of play in each of the holes. So any kind of rotation that might tend to take place at the end of that member will be allowed 
by uh, the free play of those holes. So this is effectively a pin joint also, although if you have multiple bolts and you get the bolts far enough apart and they have a good enough lever arm and the holes are tight enough, you can get a moment connection out of those bolts. Here's another example. We have a, a quite deep beam, which is very sturdy. The moment is going to get transmitted through the flanges. In this case, the connection is this steel uh, plate, which is welded to the face of this um, tube. And in fact, actually, in this case, the tube is slotted. The plate goes all the way through and forms the plate on the other side also. And then this is fully welded all the way around to keep water out of the tubular uh, column. And you'll notice this plate is not vertically very tall compared to the depth of the beam. And the bolts are all fairly close together. And all of these bolts have some play in them. So any movement in terms of the tilting of the end of this beam is likely to be very freely accommodated by those bolts and the, and the play in the holes around the bolts. So we would say in the context of this structure, this is not a moment connection, it's a pin joint. Now you might look at that and say on the human scale, if you had to try and bend uh, the end of this beam and it was restrained by bolts that are that strong and that far apart, you would say this is a moment connection and I can hang on this and it'll hold my weight and so forth and all that's true but in the context of something as sturdy as this beam right here which is quite deep and which has very powerful flanges uh, this is a pin joint in that it's going to allow all the free rotation that's likely to occur at the end of that beam because there's not going to be very much rotation because of the depth and stiffness of the beam. So we would call this a pin joint. And that might be uh, intuitively a little difficult for you to grasp. So take a look at this and make sure you understand that when we grab the web like this and the bolts are not very far apart, uh, this is not a moment connection. Here's another example. Here we have a beam and usually beams in steel, we just bring them to the, to the top of the column, and that's the termination point for the beam. In this case, this beam got cantilevered over, and, and when we get to chapter six, we'll talk about what the philosophy was behind doing that, but it's actually an extremely rational and clever thing to do, but we need to set up the arguments that explain why that is. But that's been cantilevered out to here, and then there's a simple connector there, and I wish I had a close-up of it, but you can see that there's almost no connection uh, that, that's of any kind of really sturdy nature. There's, in fact, a pretty big gap there, but there's a plate which is welded to one beam, and then it's bolted to the other beam, and it represents a shear connection between the two beams. So, you know, when when you can see daylight through there like that, that this is not intended to be a continuous moment connection. It is just supposed to be a single force or at most a two force connection, but there's no moment associated with it. Okay, so here we have another example of something that's pretty much a pin joint. Um, the materials coming to rest on the top of this column are not strong enough or deep enough to represent significant moment connections. Also, it turns out in most instances, this bottom cord, uh, the double member or double angle member that represents the bottom cord of this truss is coming on each side of this plate. And most of the time when you look up at that plate, you'll see a sliver of light on each side of it. In other words, there's no real connection between that member these two double angle members and this uh, steel tab that's coming out. And the purpose of having this steel plate coming out is to keep the bottom cord of this truss from kicking out to the left or the right 
as a mode of buckling failure to collapse the truss. So if, on the other hand, we weld this bottom cord to this piece, then the overall depth of this connection, instead of being the depth of this end bearing assembly, the overall depth becomes the depth of the truss, and then that does become a fairly substantial moment connection to the uh, column. Here's another type of connection which is uh, not intended specifically to be a moment connection, but here's a, here's a bolt that's going through. That bolt is purely for alignment. Then there will be welding along here, welding along the other side, welding along here, welding along that seam. And this is a tension or compression member depending upon the direction of the horizontal force which is used to brace the building. And this bolt, by the way, is strictly there for alignment purposes. If we tried to use that bolt to make this connection, it would bend almost immediately, even under the slightest force. Here's another connection of the same type down below. That ends our video on one force and two force connections. In other words, on roller joints and pin joints. And our next video will be on moment connections.